ready for when the guys are ready. So I have still got okay, folks. I think uh, we will go ahead and get started. Um, we are now uh, doing an experiment with also streaming this live on Facebook on our um, group chapter page. So if anyone is feeling adventurous and would like to on a separate monitor, take a look at that and give me some feedback later, um, we will know whether or not that's a, a nice approach for larger meetings. Um, so welcome folks. My name is Carol Bolsch. I'm your chapter chairperson for 2021. I'm very pleased to welcome our speakers for this evening, Joanne Baumgardner from the Wild Farm Alliance and Kate, <laughs> and my brain is going soft in my old age, Katie Reniker from the Carmel Berry Company, who is uh, also with us this evening after some exciting glitches with the internet. What would be one of these meetings without some exciting glitches, right? So hopefully we've had our glitch for the night. Um, we will be recording this meeting, so I do ask that you keep yourself on mute, um, and if you decide to use your microphone, that you uh, minimize any exciting comments that I would be pushed to have to edit out at some later point. Um, so with that said, I am going to um, record our session starting now. Okay. And again, welcome our first speaker this evening for the Monterey Bay County chapter of the California Rare Fruit Growers is Joanne Baumgardner, Executive Director of the Wild Farm Alliance. She's here this evening to talk to us about how we could better make use of the birds in our gardens and orchards. And with that, uh, Joanne, please take it away. All right, thank you, Carol. Thank you for inviting me to talk this evening. Um, yeah, I'm Joanne Baumgartner with the Wild Farm Alliance. We promote a healthy, viable agriculture that protects and restores wild nature. And I'm based in Watsonville, California. We have a national board and a national focus. Um, so, Let's see, how am I gonna advance this? Um, here we go. Um, so tonight I'm gonna talk about which birds are insectivores, which are carnivores and who are the omnivores. I'm gonna discuss their pest control services, how to manage pest birds, what birds need, um, how to design a farm and or garden based on birds foraging strategies and our songbird farm trail. So the overwhelming majority of songbirds nesting season because they're feeding insects to their young. Even birds like this, brewers, black, blackbirds that sometimes can cause problems when a crop is ready to harvest, but when they're feeding their young, they're feeding them insects. And so we wanna make sure that we can coexist with birds like this, support them uh, when they're good and discourage them when they're not. Some birds encourage year round the insectivores and carnivores. And so, if you, um, we blow this, um, that sheet up, which is part of the, uh, our um, supporting beneficial birds and managing pest birds document, which you can download off our website. Um, you'll see that insectivores are birds like ash throated flycatchers and also cliff swallows. And, and some birds like these can be supported with bird boxes and others by them build nests under eaves. Then there's uh, some other kinds of insectivores that need habitat to build their nests, like this bush tit and this yellow warbler. Carnivores also need, many need habitat to build their nests, but some will use platforms like the great blue heron and or boxes like barn owls. And then there's the omnivores and granivores. These are the birds that we need to figure out how to coexist with them to support them when they're good and discourage them when they're bad. And that is birds um, in the crow family, the mockingbird family, sparrow, blackbird family. So um, this talk in a, in a lot of ways is about avian pest control. And there's been studies around the world on this topic with these different kinds of crops, everything from coffee 
and broccoli to corn and um, grapes and almonds. And the studies actually uh, have been occurring for quite some time in the 1880s. Uh, the precursor to the USDA started the Economic Ornithology Division. And um, up until the 1930s, uh, they were looking at birds, uh, asking farmers to shoot them, <laughs> pickle their stomachs and mail them in. And um, there was almost 700 papers published in that period because of um, this work. And uh, but then uh, DDT happened and um, not advancing for some reason. Um, shoot. Oh, okay. So, so this is that uh, booklet again, supporting beneficial birds and managing pest birds. And in the appendix, there's almost 120 studies that we compiled that show how 90% of them are help pest control. Birds are helping with pest control. But birds aren't doing well uh, it, across North America. In the last 50 years, we've lost about 3 billion birds. So the more that we can do to support birds, the better it is for them. And there's also an eclipse occurring. We're not really sure why. It probably has a lot to do with pesticides and climate change and habitat destruction. But there could be other reasons. And birds eat lots of insects. So I'm sure that's part of the reason why they are in decline. Um, so what are some of the examples of uh, birds helping with pest control? This uh, woman, Julie Jedlick, have studied bluebirds in vineyards for 10 years and found that when you put up bluebird boxes, it increases their presence 10 times. And also um, she put out sentinel out in the vineyard and found that they were eaten two and a half times about more than um, in the control without the boxes. She also looked at the um, feces of the birds and using DNA analysis found that they eat sage leafhoppers, which are closely related to uh, another pest that carries Pierce's disease. And she thinks that they, in a year when there would be that pest around, they would really reduce um, the incidence of Pierce's disease, which kills the vines. And um, this is, there's a lot of vineyards putting up uh, nest boxes. Um, one that we have been working with recently has put up 800 nest boxes in um, less than 300 acres. Um, I did my master's looking at birds eating collie moth and apple orchards here in my area. And um, researchers have looked at this because apples are grown around the world and looked at which birds were eating uh, collie moth. Um, in uh, all around uh, the globe. And, and so there was a range of, of benefits, uh, but it was somewhere between 13 and 99% of the overwintering codling moth were eaten by birds. Uh, codling moth also occurs in walnuts. And um, more recently, the uh, um, study showed that birds were killing about 35% of the overwintering codling moth. Now, barn owls, I think a lot of people know are beneficial. A lot of farmers put up boxes and um, you can, uh, they, well, they will hunt in this, these studies were in vineyards. They hunt in vineyards about uh, a third of the time. They hunt in grasslands about a third of the time. And then they're hunting in other natural areas. So the more natural area around, the better, um, uh, possibility you'll have at having um, barn owls occupy a nest with uh, rodent pest control. Oh, what I didn't say is a pair of barn owls and four nestlings would eat uh, a thousand rodents in a nesting season. It's a lot of, a lot of rodents. Um, so um, you can learn about putting up nest boxes by going to Cornell's Nest Watch and you can download um, plans for nest boxes and learn lots more at that website, which is really helpful. You can also put up um, perches, but only if there aren't trees around um, because the birds will use the trees first. But if 
if you have big open areas, putting up boxes, I mean, putting up um, perches is, is good. And, and also putting them on the tops of hills versus the bottom, if there is that elevation change, um, they're gonna use them when they're at the top. So um, there's risk and benefits to birds in agriculture. You know, they, they can get food and we could provide cover and water for them. But um, it, we can also, um, you know, expose them to pesticides and have uh, lower quality uh, food and, um, and maybe then they wouldn't uh, reproduce as well if, if they were to um, try and live someplace else. So we really, we're going to encourage birds, it's best to um, not use lots of pesticides and I'll talk about some other things that um, make it risky for birds. Um, in this study, this was done along the central coast of California, uh, where they, the researchers looked at birds eating um, pest insects and strawberries and also uh, eating strawberries themselves. And what they found was that the birds were um, in a diverse farming situation where there was lots of different crops grown and there was habitat, hedgerows and other kinds of habitat around. Um, the birds did very little strawberry damage. But um, when there was big monocultures of strawberries, the birds were really impactful and, and, and ate a lot of strawberries. And what the researchers think is that it has a lot to do with if, there's the, if that's all there is to eat, they're going to eat it. And even some of these insectivores, the, the flycatcher and Phoebe eating some of the strawberries. Now, um, uh, this is an example of almonds, uh, corvids like crows and jays and magpies will eat almonds before the harvest, but they also come in afterwards when there's mummies hanging and where the, the fruit that didn't get picked and, and the grower needs to go in and get rid of those mummies so they don't overwinter pest diseases and, and uh, insects. And, and, and these birds help that with that so much so that in New Zealand, they found that they were helping up to a couple hundred dollars per hectare. And um, other researchers have found that starlings, European starlings, which are non-native, but they evolved or you know, lived for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years around olives, they will do the same thing, go in and eat the olive mummies after harvest. So, so there are some birds that are a problem, right? And especially for fruit like this. And so what do you do about that? Well, there's different kinds of deterrence from visual sound. Um, some kinds of modification, exclusion, and some of these other things that I talked about. Um, so some visual uh, that work somewhat are uh, have to do with, um, uh, you know, putting up some kind of scaring device, but usually the birds get used to it. This right down here with the arrow, there's a study looking at drones and the, the drone that look more like a hawk was uh, worked better than the other drones. But the problem with drones is it's, it takes time to, to run those drones. And then th there are studies looking at um, lasers and lasers uh, are, they, the researchers um, are concerned that it, they could be dangerous to birds. Um, and I don't think we know one way or another for sure, but, but we do know that we are not supposed to have, be out where these, are um, being used uh, out in the fields and neither are livestock. So it's, it's likely that it's not the greatest thing for birds. Um, you can use sound, sounds like distress calls and predator calls and just loud noises, but that sometimes is really uh, annoying to neighbors. And then this is a new tool that um, this little machine back here picks up uh, bird sounds and then responds. Look at it, just needs a little solar panel. And then if you could plug different things into it, whether it's, you know, some kind of noise cannon or this um, inflatable man. And inflatable man, I've heard, works pretty well because it's unpredictable. And uh, so here's another example of a uh, farmer was having problems with sparrows coming in, eating their uh, these, um, I think that's a fennel crop, but also their lettuce. And so he took the sprinkler head off of the, this line of sprinklers and put PVC teas on there. And right away, 
he got a Cooper's hawk coming in. And since then, he hasn't had any problems with the sparrows. But exclusion, i.e. putting up netting, is the best thing to keep uh, pest birds out. Um, now, this was in Michigan, where they put up American castrol boxes and found that um, growers save millions of dollars because the kestrels, who mostly eat rodents, small rodents, can catch birds, will eat them, and scare the heck out of them. So, um, yeah, so that is can be really effective. What we don't encourage is for growers to put uh, to take out habitat to scare off big or to keep big flocks of birds from coming in because these big flocks if you could imagine if you're flying really high and you see a hedgerow now this hedgerow here is about 20 feet wide but you know this flock is not going to be attracted to that hedgerow now if this was a, a a field of wine grapes they could be attracted to that so um habitat is not it depends on what the birds are, is whether uh, there is habitat, and the and the big flocking birds are not using habitat. Um, okay, let's see. So, um, where are the crop pests? They're flying in the air. They're on orchard trees, and they're in bushes. So, so we want aerial insect. Like swallows, and and again, sometimes this tree swallow uses a, a nest box, and then um, this barn swallow is building a nest inside a barn. Um, other aerial uh, or birds that are hunting on the wing um, are are like this Cooper's hawk and the kestrels, which I mentioned earlier, uh, and these birds are eating rodents, but they're still flying to um, catch their prey at a high level. Then there's birds that are gleaning more in the shrub layer and down on the ground, like bluebirds, which again can be supported with nest boxes. And then there are birds that are gleaning um, <clears throat> codling moth, like down here on the left and or these little caterpillars lots of leaves um, uh, on trees in orchards. So we want to support all those different kinds of foraging species. And I've been on farms that, uh, that support all these different kinds of uh, uh, foraging helpers. And um, obviously it was a big farm, it was diverse, but, but still, um, it, you know, you can, within, within the confines of your site, you can probably support several uh, kinds of these strategies. You don't know much about birds, you can download this Merlin Bird ID app and it's free and it helps you figure out what you're looking at based on the size and the color and some other questions. <clears throat> um, that's by Cornell and so is this all about birds, um, which you can not only look up, you know, uh, what they look like and what they list, what they sound like, but where they live and and, and more, and uh, it's a really great resource. So what do birds need? Well, they need to live, whether it's in a nest box or in some habitat, and they also need habitat for cover to, to keep, get away from, from um, predators and also uh, cover from the elements. Um, and sometimes that habitat is also providing food for them. They need water and they need safe farm fields i.e. not uh, lots of pesticides around. So some of the birds that we are putting up, lots of bird boxes, I think um, got a couple hundred up on farms now and working with others to put more up. And um, we're putting up boxes that work for Western bluebirds. And you can see there's a, a hole guard right here that will only let in that size of bird or smaller. So mostly it's tree swallows and Western bluebirds use those, but all of these birds will also use that nest box. So there are cavity nesters like these birds, and then there are other birds that are not cavity nesters. Sometimes uh, putting in a hedgerow, uh, like in this study, they found that um, birds will eat um, 
pest insects. And this was a study looking at um, birds were eating 24% of the pest insects in an adjacent kale crop. Uh, and in this study, put, when there was, the field had at least two trees and an alf, next to an alfalfa field, um, they had 13 bird species, whereas um, when it was just dirt and weeds on the edge, they had only five species, but, but um, the birds were helping to reduce insects pests in alfalfa and, and on average is about 33%. So providing vegetation is important and growers are doing that with hedgerows. You can do that in your backyard. I have native plants in my backyard and so if they support lots of birds. Um, so whatever scale you're at and or if you have riparian uh, habitat, um, that's a great place to start to or conserve that habitat and restore it. There's a couple of different websites, <coughs> excuse me, that are really great for helping you figure out what kind of plants to plant using native plants. And, and so uh, this is National Wildlife Federation on the left and Audubon on the right, and you type in your zip code and they'll make suggestions. Um, and I'm talking about native plants for uh, a couple of reasons. One is because they support lots of caterpillars, caterpillars that birds, adults uh, feed their young. And as you could imagine, they're softer than say a beetle, um, which is harder to stuff down a little chick's neck. And, and um, when there's not enough ground, there can be, um, with, with this kind of food, there can be nest failures. So in on the East Coast, uh, oak trees, oh, that genus oaks will support 500 uh, species of caterpillars. Here in the West Coast, it's more like 150 species, but still, that's a lot of food. And this just makes that point a little clearer. The green bar are caterpillars, where, whereas the other bars are different kinds of insects and caterpillars dominate nestling diets in 16 out of 20 bird families. So um, I took this picture of a chickadee holding caterpillars in a willow tree and willows like oak trees support very many caterpillars. Whereas some other uh, uh, natives will support many caterpillars like this orange crown and or like this bladder pod bush will support just some caterpillars. So it depends. There are definitely some native plants that are better than others for supporting caterpillars. And um, then another way to look at it is how long does the fruit on a plant, um, it, how long will it be or how many seasons will it be available? And this wax myrtle will be available for four seasons uh, or its fruit will for birds like tree swallows and um, honeysuckle berries will be available three seasons, dogwood berries, two seasons. Um, and then looking at the flowers, how long are they flowering? Well, Pinstamen will flower and provide nectar for hummingbirds for, and other birds for three seasons. Uh, Oregon grape nectar for two seasons, Cleveland stage nectar for two seasons. And then looking at habitat in another way, um, well, for nests. So like, big oaks are going to support great horn owlet nests, potentially mid-story elderberry, which we're going to hear about in the next talk, um, can support birds like red-winged blackbirds and their nests. And understory sage supports smaller birds like costa hummingbird nests. So what else do they need besides that habitat? They need water. They need water for drinking, for washing, for making mud nests, uh, and sometimes just leaving a drip going. I know that's not good in a drought, but it, you know, put a little pan underneath that drip and you're going to support a lot of birds. What we don't want is um, toxic chemicals being used around birds. Neonicotinoids are um, some of the worst. One treated seed uh, eaten by a sparrow will kill it. Rodenticides are also really bad. They, especially the second generation type because they accumulate in the rodent before the rodent dies. And then there's this huge body burden that is really hard on raptors. Cats are terrible for birds and they uh, kill a lot of them. Um, uh, this is uh, our cat in a catio. We, in a bigger backyard, we have these other birds that are, um, living and uh, enjoying the backyard without um, 
fear of uh, getting killed. Nest Watch, which I mentioned earlier, um, talks about how to deal with predators if you are putting up nest boxes. Um, so you can go there and um, yeah, so we have, besides our website, wildfarmalliance.org, which you can see down here at the bottom, we also have this platform where you, uh, the benefits of birds on farm, you can get to it from our website and it will go through um, some of what I talked about today, but there's also lots of other sources. Um, we have a songbird farm trail on there and um, see. Oh, that was okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, think about joining us if you have a farm. We are uh, putting farms on the trail and and telling people about them, checking the nest to see occupancy rates. And so, just in Summary, uh, growers and gardeners can use nest boxes, perches, platforms, ledges. Those are the ones for, um, the ledges and platforms are for swallows. Uh, they can conserve plant and restore native plants, provide water, manage and coexist with pest birds and take care when cats and other predators are present in pesticides. We have been doing some events. We have one coming up on March 31st. You can attend it for free, it's virtual. Um, which will be at Davis Ranches where we have researchers and farmers talking about uh, beneficial birds. We also are making some short four minute videos like uh, with this um, PhD candidate, Brianna Martinico and Ames Morrison of Ventnor up in um, Healdsburg. Um, and again, you can download this document for free at wildfarmalliance.org. And that's my email address, Joanne B at wildfarmalliance.org if you have any questions and I'm gonna stop sharing. And we, I don't know if we have time for questions. I know we got started pretty late, but um, Carol, what's it look like? I can't hear you. Thank you. How's that a little better? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think we should go ahead and take some questions because it's been a very interesting talk. And it looks like our first one is from Christine Alterman. Um, she's asking how tall do barn owl perches and boxes have to be? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, you can learn more by going to nestwatch.org. Um, but um, people used to put them up really high, but now they're saying just put it up high enough that if you if you park your truck near where you're going to put the pole and when you're standing on top of the back of your truck you can reach up and clean out that box so that's about eight to ten feet high it's not that high it, um uh, but yeah people have figured out we don't need it to get them up so high that it's really scary to get on ladders and then they never get cleaned out and that's the thing about when you put up a nest box once a year you need to clean them out Uh, wow, the questions are coming fast. This is great. Um, JN is asking, what is the best approach to control oriental fruit moth? The larvae dig into the stems and fruit. I think woodpeckers can get them. Can other birds also? Mm, I don't remember seeing a study about that. But I do know that birds are always searching for insects to eat. And so if you can support them, uh, it's very likely that they're going to come and find those that pest. Um, yeah, if it's a boring insect, then probably a birds like woodpeckers are going to be more successful at that. Greg Hyde is wondering, if I install a swallow box, will it prevent them from nesting under the eaves of our house? No because those are different swallows. The ones nesting under the eaves are cliff swallows and the ones nesting in boxes are tree swallows and or violet green swallows. As, as much as you can, it would be great for you to allow them to nest a little bit around your house. Maybe you could put some kind of um, chicken wire up where you don't want them pooping say right uh, on your windows. 
Um, but to leave some room for them, there these birds are in decline, and also they're going to be helping you with pest control. Awesome. Um, Ellen is asking if you could describe a swallow platform. A swallow platform. Um, well, uh, it's just a little ledge that um, growers will put in their barns and where barn swallows will build uh, a little mud nest, a little cupped mud nest. And often they'll just, they'll do that without that ledge if there's, you know, some, the way, depending on how the barn is built. Um, what you don't want to do is have that uh, ledge be um, somewhere where the birds are going to poop down on, say, where you're packing your fruit. Uh, but other than that, um, there's, a, there's lots of barn swallows that live in barns and coexist <laughs> quite well. All right. Uh, Ralph Myers is curious to know uh, where scrub jays fall on the beneficial slash pest spectrum. And I'm also curious uh, as regards to stellar jays. We have a lot more of those ourselves than we do the scrub jays. Yeah, well, um, as I mentioned in that example with corvids and almonds, um, they will eat the mummies of, uh, that were left over from the harvest in the uh, almond orchard. So, so in that sense, they are good. I also know that, um, I think these, th so that was just corvids in general uh, and jays. I think those were scrub jays, but um, uh, I also know that scrub jays will um, eat deer ticks off a of deer. Um, not really sure how that worked, how, how that benefits fruit growers, but if you have a lot of ticks around, it could, you know, decreasing the ticks is always a good thing. Um, but I know also that sometimes uh, jays are a problem and will eat uh, some fruit. And, and so then you have to use some of those measures that I described. What we don't want to see is that um, growers put up uh, or, or gardeners put up that sparkly flashing tape and leave it up year round because then that discourages all the other good birds. You just need to discourage to put that up and then take it down after your crop has been harvested. Um, so you're only discouraging during that period when you need to. All right. Um, Greg Hyde is asking, do birds eat the blossoms of fruit trees? And how do I protect my fruit tree crops? Yeah, yeah. Well, I know birds in, in nature, birds are eating blossoms and they can eat the blossoms of fruit trees too. And, and so sometimes, you know, like I mentioned, there's all these different ways of discouraging birds. And it, if it's really, um, if you just have a couple of trees, probably the easiest and most successful thing is to just net them. Um, uh, if you have a big crop though, I mean, you still can net, growers do uh, purchase netting for big uh, um, areas of wine grape uh, growing. Depends though. Um, on the situation. In, the, in some of those really big areas, growers will sometimes go in together and hire a falconer to uh, bring in a falcon and work that falcon, you know, keep that falcon uh, going and uh, discourage birds that way. Let's see. Uh... Alan uh, suggests uh, that they discourage the sparrows from eating their plum and apricot blossoms by providing feed at a feeder. Okay. Yeah, like thanks, Alan. I have heard about that too. Let's see. I know we had one question that had come in from email from Tom. And I'm not sure I'm seeing Tom in the meeting. He was here a little earlier. Tom, are you here? No, I guess he had to drop off. Um, I am pulling a blank on his question, but do you recall the question that I had emailed to you, Joanne? Oh, sorry, I haven't Let's been looking can... at. Oh, oh, that question. Uh, the, the other day, yes. Yes, yes. It was a question about um, 
uh, can non-native plants support birds? And specifically, it was a cotton, cotton ester, cotton, I forget, cotton mm -hmm. thing. And, um, and I think that bird, uh, that bush provides a uh, little red fruit that the birds eat. And, and it, that could be good. I don't know specifically about that fruit. I, I do know that sometimes uh, native plants are brought in from other parts of the world because they don't have any pests that bother them here. And so they don't, they're, nobody wants to eat them. So they're pretty much a desert when it comes to bird food, um, if, if that's the situation. But with this plant that's providing food that could be good, I do, I have read with some other kinds of non-natives that they, they're kind of off kilter to what birds need. So sometimes in the fall, some of our native plants will be providing fruit that is really high in energy, uh, high in oils and, and helps uh, migrating birds build up fat reserves before they leave on their migration. And some other kinds of non-native plants will provide um, more sugary fruit that isn't as good for um, them building up their fat stores. So I don't know about that plant, but um, yeah, it could, it could be out of sync. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, my screen just flipped for a second. Um, JN is asking, are there insect eating birds that are active at night or is it just the bats, the insect eating bats that are active at night? Yeah, I think there's night hawks that are active in the evening. Um, don't know about at night. Okay, thank you. Um, Suzanne is, let's see, we have a couple of cautionary things here. The Greg wants to remind everyone that um, bird feeders may be carrying disease currently and to be careful about that whole salmonella scare. Thank you, Greg, that's a good reminder. Um, and Suzanne uh, mentions that cotton easter is very invasive and Toyon is a local tree that still spreads by seed, but not as much. Oh, that's so, a really good comment. Yes, I'm glad she brought that up. I didn't know that it was really invasive, but that is a huge problem to be planting invasive plants uh, because what happens is they, take over native habitat that would have supported birds and other kinds of wildlife that we care about. And let's see, Michelle is also commenting on the uh, bird feeder issue with the pine siskins. Um, she's asking if you recommend taking down the feeders. Um, well, sure. I uh, have been following that about as much as probably most people. Um, I think the latest information was to keep it, keep them down for uh, through the month of March. And especially if you if you notice that there's pine siskins that aren't afraid of you or um, look dazed or are dead, you want to make sure and keep your your um, feeders down. And I think we'll just take this one last question that we have here. This is from JN. Any advice for attracting woodpeckers? Hmm. Well, um, I know they like big trees. So uh, plant big trees that then they can make cavities out of um, and they probably will uh, arrive. I know in some of the um, I mentioned a walnut study and what the, while well, we think usually that we have to plant native habitat to, to attract birds um, in, <clears throat> in walnut orchards that have huge walnut trees, the walnut trees themselves are attracting the, the woodpeckers and the woodpeckers are the main uh, um, avian pest control happening in that system. So it depends, but big trees are good. <laughs> yes, we have big leaf maples that are enormous, and we have quite the share of woodpeckers. And it's kind of an interesting question because um, we have 
the acorn eating woodpeckers and apparently they only drill the holes in dead tree wood, which I found very interesting. Um, and I bring this up because John Valenzuela is asking us, do woodpecker like birds damage fruit tree bark? Well, there are sap suckers that will um, drill holes in uh, the barks of trees and, and then they come back sometimes uh, over and over to drink that sap and and other birds key into that and will drink that and whether or not i've never seen a study that shows that they are harming the trees so i don't know okay and reed comments that uh he's had several roost in agave americana blooms interesting all right well folks i think we ought to um turn our attention now to katie um, but before we do that, let's all give a nice round of applause for Joanne. Big thumbs up. That was a terrific presentation. Um, would we be able to download the presentation off the website, Joanne? Um, I can share this presentation. Or, yeah. How about if I, I send you a link and then if you want to share it with everybody? That'd, that'd be, be great. Okay. That'd be great. We'd really appreciate it. There were a lot of terrific charts and little diagrams and graphs that I think would be very interesting to read in detail. So, so we thank you for that. Okay. And with that said, why don't you uh, stop sharing your screen, Joanne? And we will turn our attention to Katie. Hey, Katie, I see you. I'm here. You ready for me to start awesome. my screen? I think we are ready. So just to refresh everyone's memory, uh, Katie is from the Carmel Berry Company. She's done some terrific work in uh, creating products out of elderberries. And this all kind of came about due to her initial interest in her, uh, the health of her own family. So take it away, Katie. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. But thank you so much for the talk about birds. That was really, I learned so much. It was really fascinating. And of course, it goes along pretty well with um, talk about elderberries, especially because we're going to be talking quite a bit about native elderberries today. So um, yeah, my name is Katie Reniker, and I have a company called Carmel Berry Company. And I started it um, a few years ago when our kids were coming home from preschool and bringing home all kinds of good preschool germs. And we were looking for natural immune boosters for our family. Um, and so I learned about elderberries, but all the elderberry products that I could find in the health food stores um, had thickeners in it, like glycerin, or they had preservatives, or they were coming from Europe, or they just didn't taste very good. And then I learned that elderberry is a native plant to here. I live in Carmel Valley. And um, all of a sudden, we started seeing it everywhere and started asking friends if we could pick um, on their you know, ranch or, or hillside or behind their house and um, started making our own syrup. And it was so good using fresh berries rather than the dried or imported ones that are in most of the products. It just tasted delicious made with fresh local berries. So we started um, down this road, not really knowing where it would take us, but um, so many friends really liked our elderberry syrup we were making. So we decided to make a go of it and um, have have a business. So I make elderberry syrup and I make elderflower syrup. I also make a line of preserves um, with elderberries and elderflowers in them as well. Um, and so um, I'm just gonna go to the next one and talk about what, what are elderberries? Cause I know actually over this last year, a lot of people have learned about elderberry. Five years ago when I started, I had to explain to everybody I met what an elderberry was, even though they are a fruit that goes, grows all around here. In fact, at the dinner table tonight, I told my family, you know, I was doing this talk tonight to you and my son goes, well, elderberries aren't rare. And, you know, like, why are you talking to the rare fruit growers? <laughs> and said, well, people don't really know about them, um, but it's true. They are growing probably within a mile of you, generally everywhere you are not just in um, California where we are, but they're native to almost every continent on earth. And in all of those continents, they've been used for um, 
medicinal purposes by the native cultures in, um, in that area. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about just really briefly about the three different kinds of elderberries um, that are generally the ones that you'll come into contact with the most. Um, the European elderberry is Sambucus nigra. It's native to Europe <clears throat> and it's the one that is most commonly used if you buy dried elderberries from mountain rose herbs to make your own elderberry syrup or if you buy a product made out of elderberries like Gaia herbs from the grocery store, um, they're gonna be made with European elderberries. There's Sambucus canadensis, which is an American elderberry. It's native to the uh, United States, uh, North America, east of the Rockies, all the way to the East Coast. Um, and it's the one that has been developed as uh, with cultivars to be grown um, as a crop so uh, mostly with University of Vermont, University of Missouri, they have done some work selecting cultivars um, for good juice yield, ease of harvest, you know, those kinds of, of things. Um, so it's the one that farmers in the US are really the ones that um, are being used now in fields. Um, and most of the growers are in the Midwest uh, and upper Midwest into Minnesota, Wisconsin as well. Um, I'll get to more on where growers are, are gathering in just a moment. Um, Sambucus cerulea is a blue elderberry. And that's the one that's native to here in California. Um, it can be referred to as Sambucus mexicana, um, but really it's kind of, it's been decided that it's all part of Sambucus cerulea. And it goes all the way down in Mexico, up through California, Oregon, Washington, and up into Canada as well. It has a really wide range. Um, and that is the one that is native to our area. <clears throat> so elderberries, as I said earlier, have really been used um, as a medicinal herb in traditional cultures going back thousands and thousands of years. Even though now it's taken me five years for people to learn the word elderberry um, around here, it's actually, <laughs> it's just something that we've forgotten about. Um, as a culture, but it has a very long history um, going back for thousands of years, both in Europe and it has a lots of references in European folklore. Um, Hippocrates referred it to as the medicine chest of the people. Um, and it has a very long and um, valued um, presence here in the United States within um, indigenous people's traditions as well. Still today being used, it's not like, you know, it, it was used and isn't used now. Um, in fact, the Ohaloni and the Esalen, who are um, the tribes from where I live, they consider elderberry to be one of their elders, one of the a family member. It's that much respect that they have for the elderberry. And um, so that's really important to me as I, as I, you know, interact with this plant and tell other people about um, how to grow it because it's important to me that it is known that it is that it that it has a place of honor and importance in the cultures of our our, our Native American tribes from right in our area and um, so I think it's important for us to do what we can to honor that health benefits of elderberries um, the the elderberries have quite um, a lot, uh, they have a good amount of research done on them, but a whole bunch more could be done. But here's what is known. Um, studies show that elderberries can reduce the duration and the severity of colds and flu symptoms. So studies show that instead of um, a group having, you know, flu and cold symptoms for eight days, those who were taking elderberry every day, it was the symptoms were reduced to four days. Um, they're shown to have antiviral effect against flu viruses. This was done with H1N1 and H1N5, and this was done in vitro in cells. And um, studies, multiple studies show that by um, blocking key viral proteins responsible for viral attachment and multiplication within cells, it was able to stop the virus from spreading um, within cells. There's also been a, a roundup, a meta-analysis of uh, data uh, on, of studies um, looking at upper respiratory symptoms in humans with elderberry, and it's shown to significantly reduce the upper respiratory symptoms um, across multiple studies. 
They have higher antioxidant levels than blueberries, cranberries, and pomegranates. They're basically one of the highest antioxidant fruits out of all of them. I think there's only a couple, aronia and black raspberry, that are up there with them. Um, they contain vitamins A, B6, C, potassium, iron, and fiber as well. So there's also um, some research being done on their properties for anti-inflammatory as well, work on with diabetes, with Alzheimer's and brain health, um, pretty important um, work that's being done. And then just of course, an, a disclaimer that, um, you know, the information I'm providing you is just references to studies that have been done. And we've got on our website page, we've got links to uh, all of these um, studies, the, you know, the actual studies themselves. So you can check them out themselves. So, you know, I am by no means, um, you know, saying that this can cure or help um, different conditions. I want you to make sure that you would talk with your doctor first before using elderberry as um, a medicinal tool. So why elderberries and why now? Um, there is unprecedented awareness and interest in elderberries in the U.S. Um, the U.S. has approximately 1,500 acres of elderberries in commercial production. European has over 30,000 acres, so they're well ahead of the, of the curve in this. So that means that there's a real market for American farmers to um, get, get in on this great um, burgeoning industry. Um, the Midwest Elderberry Co-op is the co-op of growers, actually not just from the Midwest, but from all over the U.S. Um, and their inquiries alone far outstrip the current supply by the hundreds of thousands of pounds of requests. So it's pretty remarkable the, the gap in um, what can be provided and the demand. Um, so it's a real opportunity for farmers and ranchers, orchardists to diversify or simply add some hedgerows. Um, and we'll be talking about that. That can also produce income. Um, and of course, here in Carmel, at Carmel Berry Company, I'm doing everything I can to source my berries um, and my flowers locally and support farmers here and um, pretty much every other elderberry company that you might come into contact with is all going to be using um, berries that are imported. And it's really important to me to only grow as fast as I can help farmers grow um, as well. So um, first we're going to talk about the American elderberry. This is the Sambucus canadensis. This is the one that's native to east of the Rockies and it's the one that has the most research behind it about growing conditions. Um, for farmers. So the challenge is, uh, especially for out here, for us in California, they, it needs water and fertilizer. Um, it's used to Midwest, you know, moisture levels. Um, and we had some mysterious fruit set in our trials in, in Greenfield is where we've done our trials. Um, and we think that that was because we had too few varieties growing um, uh, when our trials had four varietals growing, we had better fruit set than when we only had two. Um, birds are a big issue. They love elderberries and they can come in and, you know, clean out a, a crop really quickly if you're not on it with the, the kites and the tape um, and possibly netting as well. Um, challenges uh, for the West Coast, it's just not trialed enough yet to have best practice practices, yes, for the West Coast. Um, but we're working with a whole bunch of farmers um, through a group called the West Coast Elderberry Growers. We're up and down the West Coast now, and we've got farmers trialing lots of different um, ways of growing elderberries and different varietals and different species. So we're working on that. What are the benefits? Well, if you are a farmer growing this as a crop, th there are huge benefits to the fact that it has been studied for probably 40 years um, by universities. So they've dialed in some cultivars um, with desired traits, yield, um, you know, high yield, the, the head, the far head um, droops over when the berries are there, which makes it better for, or harder for the birds to get to the berries, you know, good juice, pH, et cetera, like that. Um, something that's really important about these elderberries are, is, is that they don't really grow all that tall. So you can, um, the ease of harvest and the fact that they basically all set fruit at the same time makes it, especially with labor costs here in California, much easier. Or if you're doing this in your back garden, it makes it much easier because you don't have to have a 10-foot ladder to do it. 
Um, so really briefly, to grow elderberries, uh, Sambucus canadensis, they get quite bushy and they grow into a hedgerow. Um, but they like a pretty um, balanced soil, pH is 5.5 .5 to 6.5. They do like organic matter. They like nitrogen. Um, foliar application is really good. Um, so um, I'm not going to go through all of these because I will send these to you. Um, and if you're really interested in growing elderberry canadensis on a larger scale, you can revisit these. Um, so, and we also have full growing guidelines that we can send to you. Propagating American elderberries is one of the best things about them. All you need, this is my son, all you need is, um, you know, the sticks themselves, cuttings. Um, we've left them on our driveway and come back and they're sprouting leaves, you know, three weeks later. They're super hardy and propagate really easily by just taking a cutting and sticking it in the ground. They have nodes and so you just want to make sure one node is below the ground um, and getting that kind of as deep as possible and then the other one above and they and they do really well. Um, there are, are lots of great online resources for growing um, via Sambucus canadensis. Um, there's financial modeling tools to help you figure out costs to grow it um, you know, by the acre. The University of Missouri and the University of Vermont both have excellent growing guides as well as those financial tools. Um, other gr great growing guides are <clears throat> with the, from the University of Kentucky has a good one. And they actually, you know, a lot of the things that they recommend are applicable to out here as well. Um, the, the group I mentioned, the West Coast Elderberry Growers Group, I've, um, we just wrapped up a, a series of workshops on g getting really in depth in growing the elderberries, um, all three, all three kinds, um, Nigra and Canadensis and Cerulea for people up and down the West Coast. Um, we will be doing those again. Uh, and also we've got a really great um, group going on Facebook um, where you can ask lots of questions of people up and down the West Coast. Um, and we'll be doing lots more workshops. So you can uh, join us with that and you'll get more information about that in a minute. Okay, Sambucus cerulea, the native blue elderberry. This is, um, this is probably the most important part to me of this business that um, has come into being in my life uh, because Sambucus cerulea is a native plant to here. And as we heard with the bird discussion, there's so many benefits that come with planting native elderberries, uh, especially in a hedgerow. So a lot of farmers use the hedgerow um, to attract beneficial insects and the birds that will help with pest control in their fields. But often with land that is so expensive in our area, you know, it's a really hard decision for a farmer to install a hedgerow and give up that valuable real estate that cannot actually earn them money back. Well, this is a kind of a nice benefit. Um, if you were to grow cerulea in a hedgerow, you can also um, earn some money back on that hedgerow. So the challenges of it, of growing Sambuca cerulea, is that no research has been done on it yet. We're working really hard on that with West Coast elderberry growers, but we're right at the beginning. Um, so there's no developed cultivars and, um, you know, trees right next to each other. One tree can have the most gorgeous berries, purple juice, just amazing flavor. And the one next to it can have green goo inside. So when you squeeze the berries thinking you're going to find purple juice inside and the berries look like this on the right, they're kind of blue when they're ripe. Um, they have a white bloom on the outside. So they might look perfect and you squeeze it and there's green goo inside. And it's just because it's a wild plant. There's a lot of wild variety and, um, you know, no cultivars have been selected for valuable traits for growing it as a crop. Um, so growing guidelines, especially on propagation and pruning are still being learned. Elderberry trees in here grow into full trees and they can be 30 feet tall. Um, you know, even 15 feet tall can be really challenging to manage. Um, and so, you know, that all that is labor costs if you're growing this as a crop um, or even in your backyard for you, it can be very challenging to manage a really tall tree. Um, and so, um, you know, we just need, we're just at the beginning of learning propagation and pruning techniques. Um, there's also the presence of the valley elderberry longhorn beetle, which is an endangered species. And it, 
does not apply to most to Monterey County. So we're pretty much in a, in a good area, but um, I'll show you that in just a minute where the map is and talk about that in just a minute. The benefits of um, the cerulea, it's a native plant. It already thrives in our ecosystems. Low water needs, this is a huge one for me. Um, the flowers, I consider them to be superior in flavor and aroma to the American um, elderflower and elderberry. And um, University of da California Davis has been doing some great research on elderberry the last few years. And um, they've even compared the nutritional analysis, looking at the phytonutrients and flavonoids and how they compare to the American canadensis and the European nigra. And in fact, they're very comparable. And in many ways, they actually um, have even more flavonoids, both the American and the cerulean than the, than the European one, which is the predominantly used one um, as a crop now. So, so it's exciting that it is, you know, it, it's on par and could be valued um, medicinally as well. Um, another benefit is the opportunity to create a new market, but to do it in a thoughtful way that involves the indigenous populations here on the West Coast. Um, we're working to really involve ourselves in, um, in the conversation with the um, groups that the tribal groups around us, the Esalen and the Amamutsun are two of them that are doing some really wonderful work that we want to make sure we can support. And also while we are educating other people on growing elderberries, we want people to be able to take this into consideration. We're also going to have another workshop coming up. Um, the one we, that we had a section of our workshop all about, um, you know, how to, how to grow this crop and also do it respectfully. And so we're actually gonna have a spin-off whole other workshop on that in the future. Um, growing blue elder elderberries, this is in Oregon. This is a trial field that these grow as trees. So they don't turn into a hedge like the canadensis ones. <clears throat> so they're spaced more like an orchard. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's amending a, a hole rather than a, a long strip of a field with drip tape. Um, and what's great about the elderberries and what has been discovered with the, um, the research at the University of Davis is that elderberries actually really don't need much amendment and they don't need much water to be able to have a good crop. So, you know, this is great news for, um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but it's really the, the challenge is going to be the next step of pruning and propagation. So, um, and again, I'm gonna send this so that you can, if you really want the nitty gritty of growing them, you can have more information and you can be in touch with me. I'm not gonna spend too much time on, on you know, all the inputs and pH levels. So this is actually an elderberry farm, um, elder flower farm. They're really only doing flowers in England. And they've spaced them, I think they're like 20 feet apart, 15, 20 feet apart. And they've really selected a one single liter cane <clears throat> to be formed into a trunk. And they're keeping them about four feet tall. Um, so really manageable for harvest. Um, and, uh, you know, that can be done, we are certain with cerulea as well. So, so these, are, these are nigras growing here, but since both nigra and cerulea grow into a tree form naturally in the wild. Um, that's what we are looking at as we um, learn how to grow um, cerulea in a, you know, in, in a manageable form. Propagating blue elderberries is incredibly hard. You cannot very easily just take a stick and stick it in the ground like you can with the canadensis, unfortunately. So the, the most reliable way is to do seeds because it's very hard to propagate with hardwood or softwood cuttings, but some people do it and they have about a 50% success rate. Um, so if you do find wild elderberry trees on your hikes in our area and um, or at a friend's ranch and you follow it, you notice it does not have green goo inside. It um, has great smelling flowers, the berries taste good. Then that might be one that you come back in the, in the winter and take some cuttings from and you make sure you have your two nodes and um, stick them in the ground and keep them moist, keep them protected and see if they take. 
but don't beat yourself up if they don't take because it's really hard to get candidates or cerulea to do that. There's a lot better success rate with cold stratified seeds um, that have been fermented for about five days and then um, washed clean of the water and then put in the fridge for a few weeks and then plant it out. Um, and again, if you want more detailed information, I'm happy to help. Um, but the problem with seed is that you cannot really control those traits that you are hoping for. Um, you can within a geographic area, you know, that's actually pretty good because you can actually be selecting traits from your Monterey Bay area or Santa Cruz Mountains area and keeping it to kind of a localized um, or, you know, the hills above Sacramento, keeping it to a, a localized um, uh, cultivar if you will, um, but you can't just, you just can't control the traits as well. So uh, I mentioned earlier about the Sambuca cerulea having a, um, an endangered species, the valley elderberry longhorn beetle, their habitat um, is the elderberry. And um, they grow, if you can see this map down in the corner, it's really the central valley that needs to worry about that. And if you are in the central valley, um, you, the, the main thing is, is that you are not allowed to um, cut and prune your elderberries back. You can still harvest the fruit, you can still harvest the flowers, but massive pruning is not okay. Um, whereas if you are growing the Sambucus canadensis, the American elderberry, uh, I think I quickly skipped over this part um, when I was talking about it, you actually can prune it all the way to the ground, literally mow it down chop it all the way down after the second year, every single year. And that's what helps keep it to growing only about seven feet tall. With the cerulea, um, they really like a good pruning, but you're going more for um, a single liter cane to form a trunk um, or having a few um, selected canes that, that you know can grow like a, an established bush, but help prevent it from becoming you know, a 15 foot tall tree, you, you can have some say in that. If you are in the elderberry longhorn beetle territory, you can still prune, you just have to have an agreement um, with the, um, it's called the programmatic safe harbor agreement. And again, if you're in that area, you can reach out to me and I it can help you put you in touch with UC Davis and they'll help you walk through it. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't ever plant elderberry, you just have to make sure that you always have the same amount that you planted in the first place. You never dip below that to help protect the, from the elderberry. So thinking outside the orchard box, um, other models for elderberry production, whether commercial or just yourself in your, in your backyard or in your own small farm. The, um, the beautiful thing about the elderberry is that it is already being used in hedgerows. This is at a farm in the Salinas Valley where they planted it, um, you know, as a border hedgerow for all the reasons that were talked about in the bird discussion, um, um, all those benefits. Um, the, the, the only concern with that is if you ask USDA for funding to install a hedgerow, you're not allowed to pick from that hedgerow and sell it as a crop. So you just have to keep that in mind if you're going to go for one of those grants that, that gives you money to plant the hedgerow you can get funding from USDA in other ways um, to install elderberries, but if you put it in a hedgerow, you aren't actually able to sell it, harvest it and sell it. You can for personal use. So there's so many benefits to growing it as a hedgerow. Um, another idea is the rancher partnership model, in which this case, it's kind of like me. When I first started out, I noticed my friends had a tree in their backyard and I, and I noticed that my friend who keeps horses had a whole bunch out in their pasture. Well, you know, there are rules about food safety and animals, but um, other than that, you know, there's a lot that could be done, can be done. Um, and I know people doing this up in Washington, um, creating partnerships with, with landowners where there already is elderberry or well, uh, where elderberry could be grown and having a relationship with the landowner to um, cultivate elderberries on their property. Um, there's some really great resources for the American elderberry um, for, um, oh, I did not change that title. This is, this is the Cerulea one. Um, this is really awesome because the University of California, Davis, um, it's actually their um, UC CEREP, which is um, Sustainable Education and Research 
arm. Um, they have created an entire website on elderberries, on, on the blue elderberries, California elderberries, and it's a wealth of information. So I highly recommend if you're interested, you start there um, because they, they're really doing some excellent work and I'm so thankful for all the work that they're doing. Um, so now we're going to talk really briefly about um, harvest and post-harvest, because what do you do with all these berries? Um, hopefully you've protected them from the birds with, you know, kites or deer tape or a falconer. Um, and so <clears throat> on a small scale, you might be picking from a few bushes in your backyard. Some people put those in a garbage bag, stick it in their freezer, let them freeze, take them out and bang the, ba the, ba the bag around and the berries fall off. So this is really great if you are, if it's just you with a few bushes in your backyard, super easy. The next step up is when you, um, you know, might maybe have a few rows of them and um, you're not gonna, you don't have a freezer full enough to stuff a bunch of bags in there. Well, you can, um, the best way to do that is kind of do it reverse, de-stem them first and you can sanitize them and then rinse them and then put them in the freezer. So on the right, you see a picture of, um, it's just a food grade plastic tote that's actually um, has holes in it. So the water drains out. So I put a, I put some, um, I put a cookie cooling rack on top, take a bunch of berries, rub them back and forth over the top. The berries fall through the cookie cooling rack and I've got the stems left in my hand. Once I filled that, that basket up with berries, then I submerge it into, again, my three compartment sink. Um, when I first started out was just three Rubbermaid tubs because those are food grades um, plastic. And I used a san sanitizer that was certified for organic use um, called parasitic acid. And um, I could literally just dump my basket into each sanitization step and rinse it and all the bad berries and the, you know, the dust and the um, bugs float to the top and you can skim them off. And, um, and, and at the end, you've done that three times, you've got really clean fruit, it can go in a bag. And if you were gonna sell it to somebody, you would really need it to be at that level. And then you can put it in the freezer. Elderberries freeze really well, their phytonutrients stay um, really well, even when they're frozen. So, um, the next step up really is if you're scaling up to farm size, you're going to want to have a destemmer. On the left is an, a farmer friend of mine who created his own. It's called the Terry's Elderberry Destemmer, the TED. And then down below is um, what we have done is we've modified a grape destemmer um, to destem elderberries as well. Um, and then you're going to have all these berries. And what are you going to do with them? Well, you could freeze dry them. You could dehydrate them. Um, you can juice them. And so we actually use them fresh and raw. So we, this is a cold press juice um, machine that we're using. And now we use on this one on the right, which is, which is a wine grape press machine. Um, and it squeezes all the juice out. Um, so don't forget about the flowers. Now the flowers have a lot of those same health benefits, antiviral, anti-inflammatory. They've been used for thousands of years for skin health, for eye health, um, like eye infections, skin infections, making a poultice. So they, they don't forget about the flowers because they have a lot going for them. Um, and there's a really strong market for them. The challenges of it is what do you do with the flowers to dry them, destem them? Well, you could dehydrate them, you could freeze dry them, you can spread them out onto um, a rack to let them dry. Uh, but then typically the problem is destemming the flowers takes a lot of time and labor. Um, so if it's just for you and your family, you know, do it in front of a good movie. You're just gonna, once they're dry on the stem, you're gonna rub the stem, the cluster between your hands and all the, all the flowers fall through. And if you're arthritic, your hands are gonna feel really good at the end because elder flowers are also known for um, pain relief as well. So um, if you get up to a bigger, bigger scale, um, the, the shaker style LD stemmer actually is, is, seems to be a pretty good um, solution for the elderberries. And the um, drying rack over here on the right is, um, you know, you can spread out a whole bunch of flowers all at the same time. So staying in touch with us, um, 
on the it's for specifically for commercial growers with the west coast elderberry growers is a facebook group and soon to be a you know an association we're working on a membership and some in-person conferences um so to find us west coast elderberry growers group on um on uh facebook would be it if you are a hobby grower you're just doing this for yourself and your family the Facebook group called Elderberry World is a wealth of information. And so I highly recommend you, you finding them. Um, what we did, a, we did a series of, of um, workshops. So if you are really wanting to dive into this for a commercial endeavor, um, then please email me because I will send you the recordings um, of our um, workshops. It's a little too late because to, or for uh, we've actually announced a series of grants to new elderberry growers um, to help them get started with um, with financial support and also with a bunch of um, education support. But that application is due at midnight tonight, so you might not be doing it tonight, but um, we will we will be doing it again. So um, that's all that I have. I really just want to thank you for letting me talk about the plant that I love most in the world um, with all of you. And um, just let me know if you have any questions. Excellent. That was really great. Um, there are a lot of questions. Okay, so good. Yeah, I couldn't see the questions while I was doing it. So our interest. Yeah, no, it's okay. We're going to just go through them with you. So um, the first one is from Michelle Wizen, and her question is, what is the best time of year to propagate the native blue elder? So the native blue elder, so there is, um, I mean, try it anytime. That's the just honest answer because everybody has such trouble at any time of year. There is one study that has come out that shows that actually in about a month from now, right before flowers, before um, the buds appear, is actually the best time to take green cuttings, so softwood cuttings. It, it, it flies kind of in the face of logic, um, thinking that you normally you would take it during dormancy. But um, so try it anytime and let me know, please, if you have success. Um, the green gooberry is not as beneficial. <laughs> yeah, report back. So are the green gooberries not as beneficial? Um, you know, I, I have not sent any of those to the lab. They don't taste good. And a really good sign is the birds do not touch them. So the tree will just remain loaded with berries and this tree next to it that has purple juice, the, the birds will go for those. So I kind of trust that. Um, yeah, we really don't want to, you know, I, I don't think it has all those um, flavonoids developed in them because that's in the purple juice and that dark color. Can you talk about the red fruit native elderberry variety? Okay, that's um, racemosa. Um, it's red elderberry. It generally is not considered the right um, crop for the health benefits. I mean, it's like a, it's a clean you out kind of um, fruit if that's what you're going for, but you would really need to be an herbalist to understand how to safely use um, racemosa. Re, it's the red elderberry. So not recommended for use with the berries. I don't know about the flowers, um, but generally anybody growing it to sell as a crop, it, it's a no, don't go down that road. Um, why 20 foot spacing in the English with four foot tall bushes? That's a great question. Um, so those are young. Those are um, three, three year old trees. I have seen some European ones where the, you know, the, the branches out with the flowers on the end become like 10 foot long um, first year growth and they actually use hooks to pull them down to cut the flowers. So still you can stay on the ground, you don't need a ladder. But my guess is that's why they have to be 20 feet apart is because in the future, those, those arms would, could be seven, 10 feet um, apart. Um, what was the success rate for blues propagated by cutting? Yeah, it was about 50% success rate for the cut by cuttings. Um, personally, mine has been 5%, maybe. I mean, we've, we've been trying all kinds of different things with rooting hormones and different mediums and everything. Um, I've worked with a couple different nurseries. Um, and so, I mean, I kind of forget about them sometimes. So I know that my fault would be not as good as a nursery, but even nurseries have had a lot of hard, hard time with them. 
Any tips for getting York elderberries um, to fruit? I've got flowers this year, but no fruit. So that you might have the same question or issue that we had when we went from four varietals down to only two and we no longer had fruit set. Um, I think that uh, it's been the general lore that they do not need each other for cross pollination, but after our own experiences, I, I think that that's not true. So my suggestion would probably be to plant something else. Now York actually um, tends to grow, do much better farther north in the US than, than down here in kind of the middle belt of the US. So that could be an issue too, um, but use the flowers. I've got a lot of arm waving about how everything but the berries is poisonous, including the little stems. How do you safely remove the berries from stems on a large enough scale for processing? Okay, so the University of Missouri just came out with a study was literally published a couple weeks ago that looked at canadensis, this is the American one, all parts of the plant, um, including those stems and leaves and um, seeds, and none were found to have more of that cyanide-like compound that you're referring to than apple seeds. So that's the canadensis one. Um, that is not true for the nigra, and the jury is still out for the cerulean one that is native to here. So yeah, you really need to be careful. Now, um, an herbalist might know how to use the bark, the leaves, but um, you know most of us do not. And so the recommendation is yes, do not do anything with the rest of the plant except the berries and the flowers. Now, if you do have some little stems in after you've destemmed by hand, it's going to be fine. It's not. It's not enough to hurt you at all. Um, what happens with elderberries is it's not a plant, it's so high in vitamin C, it's not a plant you wanna just like stuff a bunch of berries in your mouth by the handful like you do, would, might do with blueberries or raspberries. Um, you would get a stomach ache really fast, even if it weren't the cyanide like compound making you sick, it's just, it's really intense berry and it, it's gonna clean your system out pretty fast. So it's a berry that generally is recommended. Yes, you can eat a little bit raw, but most people um, process it somehow, put it dry and it goes in tea, um, boil it and make it into a syrup. And if the, candidate, if the cerulean does have that cyanide-like compound in it um, that is present in the nigra, as soon as it's heated, that treatment, uh, that heat changes the chemistry of that compound and it, it is no longer an issue. So if you do have little stems and you're worried about that um, being present, as soon as it's heated, that's going to um, eliminate that issue. Um, how do you harvest and what is post-harvest handling? So the harvesting, it's really actually pretty great. They, it's a cluster like, um, like grapes and you can just snip off the cluster, put it into a tote um, and bring it back to where you're going to be destemming and washing. The post-harvest handling, I, I, hopefully I covered that for you about um, washing and destemming. Um, but if I didn't, then please ask, ask another question for what you're asking for specifically. Blues are self-fertile with identical clones are, or are a few clonal selections or seedlings needed? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that. I don't, I don't think I know the answer to, the, to that. Um, I don't think we've done enough work to know if they need more than one, because most places I know have planted more than one, but we don't have actually like varietals of, of cerulea yet, you know? So we don't really know, do they need to be in the company of ones that are more different from them or not? So I think the jury's still out on that. On pruning the blues, thin to one to three main stems. Yes, that's a great selection for like one single leader cane or just a few. Are those headed down every year or let go tall? So the, the jury is still out on this and we're doing trials with um, farmers here and in Oregon. Again, we're still at the beginning of all of this. So if you like research, jump in with us. But yes, if you don't want it to get to be, you know, over 10 feet tall, you can actually keep those down, even those single, those main leader ones, even down to like a foot and a half is what some people are trying, or at the most three feet. Um, then can the main canes be replaced with newer, younger canes every few years? Yeah, they could, but if you want it to become, to form more of a trunk to, for sturdiness, 
then um, you wouldn't be replacing those. Now, having said that, I have seen hedgerows where seedlings have come up from the roots underneath and um, farmers have then mowed them down because they're mowing along the hedgerow. There's not supposed to be a hedgerow there, so they mow it down. And then the next year, those same shoots come right back up from the roots underneath and produce flowers and fruit that same year on that first, first year fruit. So again, we're just at the beginning of knowing what to do with this, um, you know, on a actual growing as a harvest, as a crop level. So, so try it both ways, you know, mow it down, cut them to three feet, cut them to one foot and uh, let us know. Um, I believe the NRCS USC has changed the planting and harvesting rules so that a certain percentage of a planting that contains many plant species can be harvested and sold. That is great. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, so again, if you are looking for, for um, help with um, funding for planting elderberries, you know, you'll, you'll be able to find out more from USDA and it sounds like possibly they've changed the rules so that you would be able to harvest and sell from that one. Can you graft or air layer the, the plants? I have, um, I have a friend who's a, a farmer in um, British Columbia. He's, he can graft anything and he has not yet successfully grafted elderberry, but he's gonna try again this year with some new ideas that he's been mulling over. Air layering, um, I believe that's what you're talking about where you kind of encapsulate, here's a stem and you put like a plastic water bottle around it and let it, for, I'm not going to say this right because I haven't tried it, but you're basically making a little greenhouse around it and they start forming um, roots in there while they're still attached to the rest of the plant and then you can cut it off and transplant that. And I have, yes, I have heard that that actually works in elderberries. So if you try that, please report back, let us know. Um, what about grafting between species or to the same species? There you go. If you have luck with grafting, let us know. Um, how do you respond to people that claim that elderberry is poisonous? I've been growing the native blue for years. And so this is what people are talking about. Yes, um, some elderberry, especially the nigra, and I, and I do believe possibly to an extent this, the cerulea has that cyanide-like compound in it that can make people really ill. Um, but again, if you heat the berries and if you stick to only the berries and the flowers, um, if you heat the berries, as soon as they're heated, that compound changes and you're fine. It's still not a fruit that you're going to want to like drink a whole glass of elderberry juice at once because it's so strong in vitamin C. Um, but yeah, there's actually people who are, are familiar with Carmel Valley and Tassajara. Um, the only time Tassajara Zen Center has had to evacuate people, um, not from fires, but med medically was in the 80s when the when a retreat people that were not Tassahara people that were using the place, they decided to put elderberry stems, leaves, fruit, all parts of it, mush it down and then drink it raw. And a lot of people had to be medical um, evacuated out by helicopter. That's the only time I've ever heard of, you know, of a, of an event like that with elderberry. So if people say that you can, you let them know, you know, heating actually does that, but takes care of that, but stick to the flowers and the fruit. Just don't mess with the rest of the plant. If I want to plant just one native elderberry on my property, where might I purchase a young tree that has good berries? Okay, so again, the propagation thing is a really big issue because people who are propagating at nurseries to plant in native hedgerows just for the habitat have not been selecting for good juice for that green goo, those kinds of things. So um, still to be determined. Um, I'm working with Blue Moon Native Plant Nursery here in Carmel Valley. And I've been providing you know, um, seeds from plants that I have been following for years to her. Um, and she's been propagating by seeds. So you could start with um, Ma um, Maggie and just see if they have them. And I know some um, up in Oregon, but um, the, there's actually Cornflower Farm in the Sacramento Valley um, or near Sacramento has, um, has been doing propagation with blue elderberries for quite a while. And I think that they might um, email it or mail it, but it wouldn't be right from Monterey Bay. Um, how do you harvest by hand or machine? I think I answered that one. How much land is required to start a commercial operation? Um, you know, 
that's a great question. If you start with a smaller amount, like half an acre or an acre, then as you expand, you could use cuttings from your own plants, assuming it's canadensis, to um, to put in your, as you expand. Um, same thing if you're doing with cerulea. Again, people are growing cerulea in like an orchard setting. It's all very new. So it's really unknown. But if you want to join us over, if you're interested in a commercial, then please contact me um, and I'll give you all the information we've, we've been collecting um, because there's a lot. How do you get rid of the tiny bugs when harvesting the flowers? So <laughs> you're right, they are covered with tiny bugs when you first harvest the flowers, like in the, in the warmth of the day, there's lots of little flowers and bugs on them. And honestly, by the time I harvest them and have them in totes and get them to the drying racks, they've basically all flown away. So I will often leave them the totes outside in the shade. Um, you know, as I bring the totes in, I just put them in the shade and the bugs just leave. They don't want to be there when they're not on the tree and they don't really like, um, uh, they don't like being in my car. <laughs> and so I sometimes will have a bunch collect on the windows and I just open the windows and they're gone. How are we doing on time? Should I keep going? I know there's a lot of questions. No, please keep going. It's good. Okay. It's great. We've got, we, we generally plan to go until nine. So okay. it's good. It's, it's great. 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, the blue in my front yard is self-fertile and has one main stem that is pruned down to five feet each year for the past five years. It is still producing nicely. Oh, that is great to hear. Thank you, Carol, for that. I love hearing that. So um, great to know it can do great on its own and that um, that if you're keeping it to a certain level, it keeps on going. That's awesome. Are any elderberry species deer resistant? <laughs> yes. Okay. So deer and birds are the biggest pests for, uh, by far of anything. Um, yes, there could be, be spotted wing drosophila, which affects some other like blueberry and raspberry crops. Yes, there could be some borers that happen or some uh, verticulum wilt. Like, yes, there are some other pests that can happen, but by far and away, it's deer and birds that if you're trying to actually use your fruit, they're, they're going to be your competition. So, um, you know, the, it's basically you're going to need to put up a deer fence if you want to keep the deer out. Um, they, you know, if any, we have a fence around, if any little leaf is, or flower is sticking out, it's gone. They get it from the outside mm -hmm. of the fence. So they really love it. Um, interestingly, chickens don't seem to like it as much. Uh, you know, rabbits don't seem to bother it as much. Um, gophers can dig a little bit down under um, and do a little bit of root damage, but it's nothing significant. Um, so it's really the it's really the deer and the berry and the and the birds. How about the truly rare white elderberry? Sambucus guadichuadinia, worth growing and eating. So this is so fun because I keep on hearing, and if you go to Wikipedia elderberry, there's this list of all these subspecies from all over the world, you know, India, Asia, um, Chile, all over, and they all have these incredible, you know, subspecies names like this one. And um, you know, I have no idea. I think if you want to try it just for the fun of it, you should go for it. Um, but, you know, I don't know of anything being done um, with with some of these smaller subspecies, then, um, you know, I don't know of anybody really doing much with them. Uh, so you should try it if you want to. I do know there's a farm in um, Florida called Hildemore. Um, and they have been trying a lot of these rare subspecies from all over the world. So if you want to reach out to me, I can put you in touch with them. And um, they've done some really great research with the University of Florida. Um, and so they might have some information for you. Um, what about fertilizing the blue elderberry or watering it? Okay, so the studies that the UC Davis did, um, they've studied, they've followed a blue elderberry planted in hedgerows at three different farms or five different farms for three years or three different farms. I don't know. Um, but they've, they've watched them for a few years now and met, you know, gauged their water needs, their fertilizer needs, their um, 
harvest and uh, <clears throat> compared them. And basically what they found for the best growing conditions out of the farms that they, that they followed them at, before the elderberries were planted into a um, hedgerow, the farm that had done a deep rip you know, is, uh, to really make sure that the, the ground was not compacted, not just digging a hole, but they did a deep rip about three feet down. Um, that farm, that seemed to work well. That same farm watered weekly for the entire first year. The other farms, um, you know, was a bit more sporadic or did it only for a part of the year um, and they did not do as well. The other farms also only did one hole. Um, you know, they didn't amend, they didn't loosen the soil around as much. So, um, and then in terms of fertilization, they actually did not feed at all. And they had great results. I mean, they think that, I think that they stirred in, I, I forget what they said, they stirred in some compost at the very beginning when they amended the soil before planting, but they were not putting in inputs um, for the three years of this study. And the Sambucus canadensis planted next to it just did terribly. It really, it needed more water, it needed more fertilizer. But the cerulean, the blue, did great. Um, and, you know, a, a, one of their trees, I think, got something like 90 pounds of, uh, th this was an older tree, but something like 90 pounds of fruit off of one tree in one season, which is amazing. Most of the others were like 15 pounds or something like that. But, um, you know, so it means that the elderberry trees, you know, it's possible that they are going to, to be um, fruiting for 40 years or more. I mean, I don't think we really know at this point. Um, but the, I, I, I'll have to ask them, you know, when their update to their study is coming out for this last year, because this last year they went back and followed again. And I don't believe any of the farms were watering at that point. And I don't know if any of them have been adding more input. So in terms of overall costs, you know, that's the real benefit of Cerulea is that it's not going to need as much. Terrific. That's uh that's great to know. We I have several wild elderberries uh, on our property, and they are the blue ones. And been debating what to do with them. So that's really great information. Um, in fact, all of this has been really great information. I'm wondering, are there any more questions that we would like to pose to Katie this evening? Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, well, again, still, if yeah. anybody wants to do, you know, if you have blue elderberries on, up on a hill on your property and you, you try something with that, I mean, we are doing organized trials and organized meaning, you know, not through Uni University of Davis. This is just any farmer who is, or person who wants to do this citizen science with us um, in terms of propagation and pruning, you know, we're, we're, putting everybody in touch with each other that's working on that, developing a, you know, a, a sheet that everybody can do their notes on at the same time, just so we have consistency of how we're gathering data um, and do it from that. It's just, it's citizen science at this point because we need all hands on deck. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I think there was just one last question and it was in regards to whether or not you offer farm tours. Oh, okay. So, boy, would I love to. I I just lost the lease to my land where we've been growing elderberries um, a, to a developer, and it's going to be scraped and built into something. So, I won't be offering any farm tours. Um, instead of of um, you know either wallowing in this um, heartbreak or deciding we're going to start all the way from scratch, finding new land where we, can, we, we can't afford to buy around here. You know how expensive land is. So instead of starting over with a new lease somewhere else, we've just decided to throw ourselves full throttle into supporting other elderberry growers. And hence the workshops and um, <clears throat> some of those will be in person. And so with the UC Davis, we already had one in-person um, workshop 
at, at one of the farms um, by UC Davis. It was really great. We learned, you know, you just learn so much when you're in person, it's a full day. So we will definitely do that again. If you're willing to go up to Oregon, that's gonna be the site of our first West Coast elderberry growers in person workshop. Um, and hopefully that will be next year when we can meet in person. And that will be what at one of our farmers there that um, has been trialing blues as well as Nigra, as well as Canadensis. So it will be really interesting. So um, please stay tuned. I would love to, you know, when we have more growers locally here, we can, we can meet on property of people here um, and, and learn more that way. Awesome. Well, we wish you uh, all the best. What a terrible thing to have happen to your trees, but uh, it sounds like you're going to do wonderful things moving forward anyway. So we thank, thank you. you for this wonderful presentation. It's been yeah. terrific. I, if everybody could do it, a nice round of applause for Katie, please. Grand job. Well, thank you so much and, to all of uh, you. Thanks for your interest in elderberries. I appreciate it. Thank you. And folks, that's uh, the end of our evening. We'll stop the recording in a moment but I will send out the presentations shortly and presupposing that our recording work will also be posting this on YouTube. So stay tuned for information on all those links. And with that, good night to everyone. <laughs> good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> good